Do you know the Muffin Man? Yeah, the one who lives on Drury Lane. People have been asking that question for centuries. Do you know the Muffin Man? Do you know the Muffin Man? But no one ever asks, how is the Muffin Man? Or has anyone checked on the Muffin Man lately? It's sad, really, because the Muffin Man has been a source of joy for men, women, and children of all ages. Ironically, though, his muffins have nothing to do with it. People apparently just think it's really fun to spread the word about his bakery without actually patronizing it. If word of mouth failed anyone, it's the Muffin Man who lived on Drury Lane. Sure, we all know of him, but how much do we know about him? I mean, not a single one of you watching could tell me who he was, where the song about him came from, or if his muffins were even any good. That doesn't mean people haven't tried, though. Experts in the field of folklore have some theories about the Muffin Man's origins. Was he a murderer? A pimp? Homeless? Or did he really just sell muffins? My name is John Solo, and I've got the answers you're looking for. So just sit back, relax, hit that like button, and enjoy. In order to figure out who the Muffin Man may have been, we first have to look at where the Muffin Man song came from. Thanks to the good old public domain, there's been no shortage of covers, remixes, and references to the baker, with my personal favorite being in the Shrek film. She's married to the Muffin Man. The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man! But none of those would exist without the OG version, which Wikipedia would have you believe was in an 1820 British manuscript called Rhymes in Time, The Muffin Man. Now, to Wikipedia's credit, that info does come from the renowned folklore researchers Iona and Peter Ropi, who claim the song functioned as a game for children and adults. While standing in a circle, one person would ask, do you know the Muffin Man? The second person would answer, yes, I know the Muffin Man, and then they would ask the next person. But the Opies may have missed something in their research, because it turns out that a year before that British manuscript was published, a curious little book called Life High and Low was also published in Britain. Yeah, whoever's job it was to scan that one in really dropped the ball. But the point is, the book contained a number of rhymes and ballads that Londoners were singing in 1819. Funnily enough, none of the songs it prominently features are still sung to this day. However, there's a footnote at the back of the book titled The Dandy Muffin Man of Drury Lane, and it gives us the following rhyme. Don't you know the Muffin Man? Don't you know his name? Don't you know the Muffin Man as lives in Drury Lane? If the publication is to be trusted, this Muffin Man song was performed in attic entertainments and at cellar balls, at promiscuous clubs, and at gallows hops by a shady fella who came in from out of town. Except the writer refers to said fella as the migrated coxcomb, because apparently that's how Londoners talked back then. For those confused, this is saying the Muffin Man was just a simple rhyme that some low-rent performer at CD Nightclub sang which is a hilarious scene to imagine. That doesn't mean he was the first one to ever sing it, though. In those days, rhymes and stories usually took a few years of oral transmission before being written down. So it's totally possible that his version was just a butchered variant of the one the Opie's referenced, which folks had supposedly been singing for years. But due to the order that these were published, it's also fair to argue that awareness of the song spread through London because of his shows, and that's what led to a variation of it being published in the manuscript from a year later. It's that age-old question of which came first, the chicken or the muffin? What's pretty amazing, though, is that regardless of the version that came first, the Muffin Man song has gone mostly unchanged for the past 200 years. Some alternate versions have popped up here and there. An 1866 book called The Art of Amusing contains a version that's been written down with a Cockney accent, where the baker lives in Quumpet Lane as opposed to on Drury Lane. There's also a Dutch version recorded in 1890, where the Muffin Man is replaced with the Muscle Man, and he lives in Schemeningen. But what if I told you the Muffin Man and Muscle Man are not the good-natured community men who the songs make them out to be. According to some folklore buffs, their Muffin and Muscle businesses may have been decoys for their secret lives as a murderer and a pimp. Before we talk about that, though, I want to shout out the folks who made this episode possible, our friends at Squarespace. The biggest tragedy of the Muffin Man is that everyone's heard of him, but no one knows who he was or if he was even good at making muffins. Well, I'm here to tell you that if he had used Squarespace to market his bakery online, his legacy would be very different. That's because Squarespace has made a name for themselves by empowering people like you, me, and the Muffin Man. 
giving us the power to build beautiful websites easily, efficiently, and affordably. From their nearly endless library of award-winning design templates to their intuitive interface that lets you drag and drop boxes as needed, Squarespace has all the answers for those looking to advertise and grow their businesses. Business owners can schedule appointments, creators can house exclusive content their audience pays to access, and all of these features are supported by Squarespace's wicked smart customer support team that's available 24-7. So if you want to join me and the thousands of mere mortals who didn't let our dreams stay dreams, just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start a completely free trial, and when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Every nursery rhyme in the English language comes with its own unique mystery. Sometimes we don't know where the rhyme came from, other times it's hard to understand what the words really mean and therefore why people sang it in the first place. The benefit with music nowadays is that while still open to interpretation, we know who the artists are. And those artists are usually happy to share what was going through their heads and hearts when they wrote the song in question. With nursery rhymes, it's anyone's guess, and so the trend has been to connect them with various tragedies throughout history, even when it's an undeniably square peg being forced into a round hole, like it is with Baba Black Sheep and the Slave Trade Theory and Ring Around the Rosy with the Black Plague. The truth is that most nursery rhymes don't mean anything. They're catchy little poems describing comical situations like Three Blind Mice and Pop Goes the Weasel, and they were almost always used in conjunction with some sort of dance or memory game. All this being said, there are multiple fascinating elements about the Muffin Man that are begging to be overanalyzed. The Muffins, Drury Lane, and of course, the man himself. So let's start with the obvious theory. We can't rule out that the Muffin Man may have really been a baker of muffins. Looking at it from a modern lens, it does seem awfully random that anyone would write a song about some baker they know, but it's also random to write a song about butts and bananas, and people have done that too. Songs can be about literally anything. Besides, at that time, the baker would have held a much larger presence in his community. Back when the Muffin Man song was first conceived during the 19th century, most households didn't have cooking facilities or kitchens. Families either cooked their food over an open flame called a hearth or bought baked goods from kitchens in the city. Vendors have traditionally been called by the products they were peddling. Milkmen, ice cream men, paper boys, pizza guys, and so a man selling muffins may have been known as a muffin man. A muffin man! Except these are not the tasty muffins that you Americans are imagining. These are English muffins, which granted can still be delicious, but back in those days, it's doubtful. Because back then, food wasn't monitored by any administration, and there were no laws to make sure that the ingredients in the food were actually safe for human consumption like there are now. So some bakers would cut corners, using substances like chalk or plaster of Paris to make their bread whiter and chunkier without having to use more valuable ingredients. The Sweeney Todd story takes this idea to the extreme with Mrs. Lovett's meat pies that were secretly made with human meat. With this in mind, it was necessary for people back then to know which bakers could be trusted and which ones to avoid, and one of the only ways to find out without risking your own health was to ask someone, do you know the muffin man who lives on Drury Lane? Why Drury Lane specifically? To answer that would require me branching off into a whole new subset of theories. But if you're down to join me for a stroll down Drury Lane, I'll take you there. Literally, there's a Drury Lane theater here in Illinois. I just took Lauren last weekend and it was pretty awesome. The original Drury Lane is a street in the Covent Garden district of London. It was named after Sir Robert Drury, who built a sprawling estate in the area back in the 1500s. But by the 1800s, the house had completely fallen apart. So all that was left on the street were overgrown gardens and small houses that were also falling apart. This means that even if people had been singing about the Muffin Man a hundred years before it was published, by that time, Drury Lane would have already been one of London's worst slums. So methinks the Muffin Man who lived on Drury Lane may not have been the most reliable fella. That is, if he made muffins at all, some argue that Muffin Man may have been slang for an adult ragamuffin, which is a term used to describe a dirty rag child. If that were the case, then Drury Lane would have no shortage of muffin men, meaning the song wasn't necessarily about one man in particular, but rather the entire population of Drury Lane. Basically asking, have you heard about all the bums in that there slum? Now there are some folks who argue that Drury Lane is not referring to the street, but rather the building. 
London's Theatre Royal Drury Lane, more commonly referred to as Drury Lane, was built in 1812, seven years before the first write-up on the Muffin Man rhyme. The theatre's front faces Catherine Street, while its rear faces Drury Lane, and it's actually the fourth theatre to have been built on this exact location. The previous three were burnt down, demolished, and burnt down. For those wondering, the Drury Lane Theatre that Lauren and I went to was indeed named after the theatre in London, and originally there was a chain of four other locations in Chicagoland, but the only one that hasn't been sold or closed is in Oak Brook Terrace. So where am I going with this? Well, if you look at the earliest publications of the Muffin Man rhyme, like the one published in the Young Ladies book in 1876, you'll notice that some of them don't say he lives on Drury Lane, rather in Drury Lane. So this could be interpreted to mean the Muffin Man was a ragamuffin or homeless person who was squatting in the theater because you know that if someone was indeed pulling that off, they would instantly become a local celebrity. And in that case, I can totally imagine those silly Brits using the common question of, do you know the Muffin Man who lives in Drury Lane into a catchy little song? I mean, this is the same generation of people that turned asking who are you to strangers at a pub into a local inside joke. A joke that would later be referenced by Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Another possibility is that the Muffin Man was a baker who worked out of the theater, though I'm not sure if they had a kitchen in-house all the way back in the 1810s, so he may have just sold his goods out of there. Then again, if that were the case, it wouldn't exactly make sense to say that he lived in Drury Lane. Stop me when I start overthinking. Moving on to our final theory, this is where things start to get kind of silly, but I just know that if I don't mention it, I'm going to get tons of comments from people who can't believe I didn't. So here it is. The Muffin Man is a murderer and the Muscle Man is a pimp. I think every person watching this has come across at least one Punisher in folklore. That is, a figure who doles out punishment to children in brutal fashion. Sometimes it's because the kid has been disobeying their parents, like when Krampus burns kids alive or Grilla cooks them in her stew, and sometimes they act as deterrents for other dangerous behavior. Like how legends about the Kelpie dissuaded kids in Ireland and Scotland from playing near the water's edge and approaching wild animals. It turns out there's internet legends about the Muffin Man being used in similar fashion as these figures in London. Parents used to warn their kids to be on the lookout for the murderous baker who used a muffin on a string to lure children into his bakery. Those legends are supposedly based on a real serial killer from the 1600s named Frederick Thomas Lindwood. There was a real popular TikTok about him floating around a couple of years ago, but I'll just save you guys the time and tell you now that literally 0% of what this guy says is true. The made-up story about the killer can be traced to an article on a parody Wikipedia website called Uncyclopedia. To be clear, people had claimed the Muffin Man was a warning to children before that article, but it's the details of that article that are a total fabrication. It's a total fabrication. And the reason they made it up... We made it up. ...is because there's no evidence to support these legends. It's an urban legend that never happened. Some rando just said it one day and everybody in the room was like, Sure, I believe that. Basically what happened with that TikTok. When it comes to the Dutch muscle man being a euphemism for pimp, this theory is mostly based in linguistics. So for once, I'm gonna oversimplify it. You know how the word muffin is sometimes used as a euphemism for a woman's pussy? Well, so is the word clam. And since clams are muscles, the muscle man could technically be selling pussy. And I guess the muffin man could have been too. Further evidence is that for centuries, mussels, real mussels, have been a known aphrodisiac. That's a Greek word meaning sexy food. I don't think the same can be said about muffins though, especially muffins back then. Unless you like the taste of chalk and plaster. I'm not one to kink shame. I do want you to judge the theories we discussed though and leave your thoughts in a comment down below. I'd be curious to hear which one you believe the most and which one is your favorite regardless of the evidence. Also, if you enjoyed this episode of the Messed Up Origins podcast, be sure to sacrifice the like button to the algorithm gods thrice and hit that subscribe button to get more content like this in your sub box and recommended feed. Deep dives like this one post to YouTube every Thursday, and I also post four reels every week. I hope to see you again next Thursday when we dive into the very messed up origins of Gwyneth Paltrow. Until then, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first.